years ago, in this classroom, I used to teach. And many, many years ago, you know who else used to teach in this classroom? Oh, this channel. Before that, that man right there. Yay! <laughs> many, many years ago. Yeah, a long, long, long time ago. And uh, when, when he left, I took over for a while. And then I taught more elementary children upstairs. We used to have a classroom upstairs for a number of years because we had the, all of you elementary kids, we had you divided up into uh, older and, and uh, younger uh, upstairs and, and downstairs. And I'll tell you something else. When I was teaching in this classroom, when Mr. Mendez was teaching in this classroom long ago, follow me with your eyes. There was a wall right here. This is all open now. So it's like one large room. But there used to be two rooms. This was the larger of the two. This was a smaller room. And there was a door right over there that went in from this room to that room. But we had a, we had a thought of, wouldn't it be better to have a larger room where the students could flow back and forth easily and everybody could be seen and it wouldn't be through a doorway and like that. So sometimes things change. And actually, the lesson I'm going to give today is really about how the earth changed to make things ready for life to come. Now, I know you guys had a lesson a while ago, uh, the God with no hands lesson, how the earth came to be, and I think, did you have some experiments too, and you, yep. yeah, so you had that lesson, and what did you call it? Did you call it God with no hands? Uh, or? I think just the creation story. The creation story, okay, so you had that story, and that was the story of how the earth came to be. But today, I'm going to tell you the story of the coming of life. How all life, plants, animals, and we humans came to be here. So in your minds, just try to let your mind float back a bit to the time when the earth was born as a tiny drop. Every particle on the earth was given a set of laws, a set of rules, so that when the earth cooled down, everything settled down into all of these laws. There was water, there were rocks, and surrounding them all, was the air. The earth looked like a beautiful little pearl. The sun looked at this beautiful little pearl and it looked at it day and night because it was so beautiful. But one day, the sun looked down at the earth, at this beautiful little pearl and it saw that something was not right. There was trouble. See, on this earth, so long ago, it rained a lot. And as the water passed down from the sky, it passed through the air and got mixed up with the gas and all of this rain and gas was washing away the rocks, making the sea, the ocean, full of all kinds of salts. There were also a lot of storms breaking up the rocks. And the sea, the ocean, was becoming fuller 
and fuller, and the land was being washed away. It looked as though, once again, the order that had been created was beginning to break up. Well, who was causing this? This huge problem. Who was causing it? So the sun looked at the water. Hmm, I wonder if you're causing it, the sun said to the water. And the water said, what? Me? What have I done? I am made, said the water, I am made in such a way that if I get hot, I disappear. I evaporate. And if I become cool, I fall down. And being a liquid, I have to go into cracks. So what can I do? This whole thing isn't my fault. I think it's my silly sister, the air. What? It's her fault. And then air said, what? It's not my fault that all this is happening. That the rocks are getting washed into the sea and the sea is filling up with salts and all. The air said, I have been given a job to do. And my job is to cover the earth, to keep it covered in a warm blanket of air. Because at the very top, she has a cold head and she has cold feet. And it's my job to move around and keep the earth warm. I have to always be on the run to keep her warm. But, Air said, what does water do? She jumps on my back and she takes a ride. And then it's fine if everything is all flat, but if there are mountains, Air said, I have to climb up. And she's very heavy and I have to drop her. Silly thing. And then I can't play all the time. I have serious work to do. If you ask me, it's not my fault, Air said. Is the fault of those rocks. The rocks. Yeah. They are so full of wrinkles and bubbles, they have no consideration at all, Air said. When I move, when I move around them, they don't move an inch to let me pass, and on top of that, sometimes they're freezing, so passing next to them, those cold rocks, I have to cringe. And sometimes they're so hot that I have to climb up to avoid getting burnt. And the rocks started to protest. They said, how can you blame us? We're not to blame, said the rocks. I mean, our job is just to sit around. It's not our job if things get really hot. What can we do? That's how we're made. If you ask me, the rock said, looking up at the sun, it's your fault. You are the culprit. You're the one who makes us all hot. And so it went on, and all of them were really right. Each one was behaving in the way that they had been made. Each was behaving in the way that it was supposed to. Yet the order on the earth was being threatened. What to do? What could be done? Well, then, at just the right time, something new was created. Tiny, tiny, tiny drop of jelly, so tiny that you couldn't even see it. And to this tiny drop of jelly, God said, I give you something no one else has had. I give you sensitivity. In order to exist, you have to eat and grow. But all of you will not eat the same thing, and you will have the power to create others like you. That is your specialty. 
So then, life came in the form of all these tiny little drops of jelly, each of whom had laws to follow. Each had to eat, they had to grow, and they had to create others like themselves. They were like tiny little machines, and they made other tiny little machines by splitting up. Just like, imagine you had a car and you're driving in the car, and all of a sudden, the car divides in two, and there are two cars going along, and then those cars divide in two, and pretty soon you have a lot of cars. Well, in the same way, these new little bits of life were able to divide up and create others like themselves. Through these tiny little drops of jelly began the work of cleaning up the sea. Remember, the sea getting all full of rocks and salt was the problem. So here came these tiny little drops of jelly in the water to solve this problem. And as they fed upon the salts of the earth, excuse me, as they fed upon the salts in the water, they built their own bodies with them. Some of them kind of found the water itchy, and so they built shells to protect themselves. And when they died, these tiny little shells dropped to the bottom of the sea, and the salts remained trapped in these tiny shells. And as time passed, and these creatures lived and died, layer upon layer of this new kind of mud piled up at the bottom of the sea like a book the book of the earth and some of these pages down deep at the bottom of the ocean have remained for us to read later on so that we could tell what happened a very, very long time ago before anyone was born. These first tiny little creatures were made up of just one cell that did all of the work. The work of breathing, eating, and getting rid of what they did not want, and drifting around in the seas, cleaning up the ocean. As time went on, some of them seemed to say, hmm, you know, if we join together, instead of just being one little tiny cell, if we join together, we might even be more efficient. We might be able to do a better job. And along came slightly bigger creatures made out of several cells. And they too went on feeding in the water of the seas, growing and creating others just like themselves. So some of them, though, thought we can do this even better. Why not have some cells do one job, some cells do another job, some cells do another job, so the cells were lined up and some said, okay, you do the eating and you do the moving and you do the breathing and cells began to specialize, began to have just one task to do instead of all the tasks, all the jobs together. And so came creatures with arms or legs or mouths or hearts creatures with organs. And when the book of the earth opened up the first pages that we can read, all of these types of creatures were already there. And I'm going to unroll this part way and then talk a little bit about it. And then I'll, I'll unroll it a little bit longer and talk even more about it. That's okay, it can, it can kind of skid up there. You know what I think I'll do is, will you please get me another book from over here?
Could you hand me that book, please? Yeah. Yeah, thank you. So this is the coming of life timeline. And this timeline will be open for all of you to look at and to spend time with in the next week or so. So you don't really have to see too much of it right now because you'll be able to spend all the time you want with it later. But I'm going to start telling you a little bit about it and then a little more as we continue the story of the coming of life. So these little creatures that were starting to specialize and all, well here we see some of them and some of them are still alive today. Here we have an amoeba with no shell. You don't need to come up close. You could just kind of look from a distance and remember, you'll be able to come up much closer and see at a later time. So there was just one cell that did all the work. And here there's a one cell flagellate that moved around by these little whip-like things on the end. So some of these are still the single cell creatures where there was one cell that did all the work. And here we have some sponges. We have some sponges that come up. Sea anemones, which stayed put on a rock and moved their arms to eat when tiny creatures were passing by. And one animal that there was a whole lot of were these trilobites. And you can see these trilobites all along here until finally they all became extinct, which means there were no more trilobites after a while. But how do we know that they live? Because you can find these trilobites. Yeah, you can all move back now. Yeah. These, you can find old bodies of those trilobites in rocks sometimes if you're walking along. You can, and yeah, some of you may have already been, been able to find some. I'm not going to call on anybody right now, but maybe you have. Uh, they were many sizes. Some of them were very big and some were very small. But they were almost like the kind of lobsters that we have today. And as time went on, all kinds of animals appeared. There were a lot of different experiments. And here, there's a cephalopod. And it had its feet on its head. Yeah. Can you imagine that? Its legs on its head. Yeah. So now there are no more of these giant cephalopods left, but the reason that we know they lived is because their old bodies are found and dug up in the ocean somewhere. Yeah. But anyway, the what I want you guys to know is that there were many, many, many different kinds of experiments to see that life had, to see how the problem could be solved. Now these, these, you can see these sea lilies here, and the sea lilies survived by when little, they would be at the bottom of the sea and the tops of them would kind of float around in the currents and then a little creature would would, would uh, swim through them and <laughs> they'd grab them. Yeah, that's how they looked. And because of their looks and color, no, 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 no you, have, you have to stay back, but you will be able to come and get a really good look later. Yeah, you will. Uh, because of their looks and color, they were called sea lilies. And there are more of them down here. 
that you'll be able to see later. You can see how beautifully colored they are. And when they died, all these rings that make up kind of like their trunk or their stalk would all just collapse into the very bottom of the ocean. And those are, those are still around today. Yeah. Now, among these, there were also some creatures that instead of eating other creatures, there were some that came along that made their own food. Yeah. They did this with the salts of the water and sunlight. And they too drifted around in the sea. And at some point, some of them decided to see what it would be like try and live outside the ocean. Floating along with the tides, they got carried to the very edges of the sea, where they remained until the tides returned. And they found out that the air outside of the water was full of a gas that they could make use of for their own food. So they remained there at the edges of the sea, feeding themselves. And when they died, their bodies remained, preparing the ground for others to come. And those are the very first plants that we begin to see. And the very first corals. And I think what I'm going to do now is, Mr. Mendez, could you help me with something for a minute? What I want to do is I want to just kind of pull this up and bring another, yeah, take it up to about there and you can just put a book down where you are. And I'm just going to let this kind of roll up part way. from these creatures that ate each other to creatures that started to live on the very edges of the sea and they found that they could make their own food. So for the first time, life was moving out of the oceans onto the land. And these are the first plants. While this was going on, there were two other new kinds of uh, plants, uh, excuse me, there were two other new kinds of life that came along. And there was a new strange little animal that had a rod inside its body, like a, like a stick. But this stick was made of bone. And these new creatures, like that, were the very first kinds of fish. And we can see some of these very, and you'll be able to come up closely and look at this in days to come. But there were all these different experiments with fish. All sorts of different kinds. So for, the, so for the first time, it used to be that animals, they had a shell on the outside of their bodies, like with a lot of these, these early creatures that came along in the ocean, that lived in the ocean, but now the shell was sort of transformed into a rod of bone inside, and those were the first fish. Some were very big with armor for protection. Some would remain buried in the mud and catch other animals as they passed by. But then you know what happened? I'll tell you. Slowly over a long, long, long period of time, the land began to rise up. And there wasn't as much rain as there used to be. And in different places, 
the water was closed off from the ocean and the water began to dry up. Well, if you're in a place with no rain and the land begins to dry up, if you need water for your life, what do you do? You have to solve the problem. So some of the fish that were trapped in these small places where the water was beginning to dry up said, hmm, what are we going to do? And then some of them had a, a tremendous thought. They said, I'm going to make a little sack inside my body and line it with water. And then I can breathe outside the water. They found the secret of breathing outside of water, and then came the amphibians. Animals that lived partly in water and partly on the land. The fins that they used to have as fish became useless, and they were changed into legs to walk on the land. Animals like frogs and salamanders appeared, and with them, with those first amphibians, came something that had never, ever happened on Earth before. There came animals that could make a sound. The silence that had been before was broken because now we had the voice of the frog. First time a creature was making a sound. And the amphibians really enjoyed their life. Here we see a lot of amphibians now. On this chart it says the development of amphibians. And you'll be able to see it. You can see the rise of the amphibians as they come along. And for a long time, the amphibians were sort of like the rulers. And there were a lot of insects around and a lot of plants, so the amphibians could easily live. Because amphibians, you know, like frogs and salamanders, ooh, they love insects. Mm. And they also love plants. So they were very, very happy. But a problem came up. Another problem. Well, because of the way that their skins were made, these amphibians, they needed to stay near the water. They needed the water to lay their eggs in. But some of them didn't like that. They were tired of having to be tied close to the water. So what could they do? They had a problem that they needed to solve. So some of them developed a skin that did not dry out, not even in the sun. And for their eggs, they developed a shell that could go around the egg so the egg didn't have to be laid in the mud or in the water. These new kinds of animals that came out of this experiment were the reptiles. We can see some of those reptiles here. And there were so many different experiments with different kinds of reptiles, different sizes and shapes and colors and everything. With this new kind of skin they had that didn't dry out, and not having to be around water to lay eggs, they could move around a lot more freely and they traveled all over the land. This was new. There was nobody there to stop them. And the reptiles became almost like the lords and masters of the earth. They invaded everywhere, the reptiles. And they grew and they grew. And they had bony skeletons inside them to support the weight of their muscles. 
and some of them grew to enormous sizes. And if we look at this chart here, just take a look. Here's a man, like this big. But look how big the man is compared to this giant reptile. A man like me, I'm about six feet tall. But this reptile, this dinosaur from the tip of her head to the tip of her tail was about 80 feet. That means if you had her tail over against the far wall in the playground, her head would be over inside the church building. What? what? Yeah, way over there. Can you imagine? Can you imagine how large this was? So there were a great many experiments that were made with the reptiles. This dinosaur's head alone was larger than a human being. So if I were standing up, that dinosaur's head would be bigger than I am. In fact, he was so big that he had to have two brains. One brain in his head and another brain way out in the tail. Because if he just had the one brain in his head, if there was some other creature over there munching on his tail, the tail was too far away for the brain to know about it. So that creature developed a second brain in his tail. All right, then we're going to look at this one. This is a Tyrannosaurus rex. Yeah, and you can see how big the Tyrannosaurus rex is compared to compared to a human, right? A human is this tiny. Now, can you imagine, not now, not now. Can you imagine if these animals, these Tyrannosaurus rexes, had a fight, how much the earth would tremble? Well, these huge reptiles moved all over the earth, and the smaller animals didn't stand much of a chance because these guys were so big. And some of the smaller animals fled to places that the reptiles didn't go to. And they were smaller animals, and they only needed a small amount of food. And many of them raided the eggs of these reptiles and ate them. But you know, the reptiles didn't care about their eggs, so they didn't mind if other creatures came along and raided them. And as time went on, these animals, the smaller ones, developed something new to protect their skin and keep them warm. Some of them developed fur, and some of them developed feathers. These were the birds and the, and the mammals. And, but what about their eggs? Well, the birds and the mammals didn't want to leave their eggs laying around for, like some of the reptiles did. So they carried them around inside their bodies, the mammals did. Now the birds couldn't keep their eggs inside because they had to fly around. So they built nests and sat on their eggs to keep them warm. And when the little ones hatched, they fed and guarded them, sometimes with their lives. Now the mammals kept the little ones inside their bodies until they were ready to come out. And when they were born, the mothers fed them with milk. Well, this was very new. This hadn't happened before. And once they and most of, the rep, uh, most of the reptiles didn't do this. When they 
laid their eggs, they just left them and didn't care about them. But the parents of mammals and birds stayed with their young until they could take care of themselves. This is something, this is something that was new. And if anyone came to eat the babies, the parents took care of them. This was a new way of caring. Most of the reptiles didn't do this. And by the time these new animals arrived, the birds and the mammals, could you help me again and we'll just kind of scoot this down? these birds here. And some of the early birds were like flying reptiles. But then gradually the, the flying reptiles really weren't birds because they didn't have feathers at all. Okay. Well, by the time these new animals had arrived, the weather began to change again. It steadily grew colder and colder you can see this beginning of another ice age right here. It grew colder and colder, and the reptiles, the reptiles who had no feathers and no fur, began to die out. The mammals took over. With enough food around, it was their turn to grow big. There were giant pigs and hippopotamuses and elephants with enormous tusks. The weather continued to become colder and colder until large sheets of ice covered almost the whole earth. And in the end, none of those giant mammals survived. But then, but then, but then something new and exciting happened. Towards the very end of this cold period, a completely new kind of being appeared. It didn't have fur like some of the other animals. It didn't have huge teeth or claws. But it came with something which none of the others had. It had a much larger brain with the power to think and imagine and reflect. It also had an enormous amount of love that was so different that this creature was no longer just an animal. This was a human being. With human beings, love went beyond their own children. It went to others of their kind, even to those men and women and children that they would never see. It was as though the earth had to have this long preparation time to make it ready for this new special creature. Because if human beings had arrived at any of these other periods, human beings would not have survived. But now everything was ready. It was as though the earth had a voice and could speak. And it said, I have spread thick carpets of grass for your feet to walk on. And I've left you with many plants with uh, fruits and vegetables and there's all kinds of meat and other things for you to eat 
my cupboards are full. And down in my cellars, we have coal and iron for you to use. And the earth said, now, all this has been made ready. It is time for you to come. And here at the very end, oh, it says here about a million years ago was the coming of the very first human being. And that is my story for today. The coming of life on earth. And as, as I said earlier, Mr. Mendez will have this chart sitting out somewhere for a few days. So you guys can come up and look at it, and and, uh, and then it'll get rolled up and put away with the rest of the charts. I shouldn't say charts, I should say timelines, because this is a timeline. And, yeah, this is the timeline of life, the coming of life. And there is so much on this timeline that I haven't said anything about on purpose. Because I wanted you guys to come up and look at it and to explore and to think about it and maybe to write about things and to ask questions and make discoveries. Okay. Now, before, before I leave, is there anything that anybody wants to say? strong voice please. So like when animals were born? Yes. Um it wasn't very hard to discover for each single like animal in the ocean. So like the animals became born out of like uh, out of like like anything like Particles and yeah. 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 So then the animals started to get even more and more animals. Right. Yes. But where, where did humans come from? Well, the humans came, and you can read about this in some of your books too. You have books that. Mrs. Gonzalez and Mr. Mendez could show you about where the human beings came from. But they came out of the natural creation like we see here. Like when the uh, amphibians got tired of having to spend time around the water and they wanted a new solution. And gradually over time, they sort of evolved and turned into, it became a new thing called reptiles. Then the reptiles got tired of having to be stuck like they were, and then gradually over time we had mammals and birds. And in the same way, that's where the human beings came from. Now there are a couple of other great lessons like this, but the very next one, that's not really a great lesson, but it's very, very important, and Mr. Mendez will probably give you this in himself is called the black strip. The black strip is a great lesson. It's a wonderful lesson, I should say. And it involves a strip about a hundred feet long. Do you have one in the classroom here? Yeah. Do you remember where the best place is to unroll it? We did it out in the playground. The best place, actually, if, and I'm sure that Adela could arrange it, is to do it in the church sanctuary, because then nothing gets dirty as you unroll it. Oh. Yeah. Okay. And if, it's, if you can start out up around where the, on the steps, up around where the, the pastor might be preaching, and as it unrolls, it'll unroll all the way out into the narthex, and it'll end right there. Okay. It's a perfect, okay. okay. Guys, I'm going to leave this just the way that it is, and, 
and you and Mr. Mendez and, and Ms. Gonzalez can figure out what you want to uh, do with it all, but I'm just going to leave it there. And again, I want to I want to thank 